Hello and welcome to Indie Designer Journal, episode 26. Today we're going to be talking about the third thing that most designers should be thinking about when designing a game. Now the first two are the ones that we always discuss, um, theme and mechanics. We are um, all over the place on our views as to which do you start with. Do you start with theme or do you start with the mechanics? And for me personally, in my little journey as a designer, it started out for me as uh, mechanics first. And as I developed more and more games and played more and more games, because you only become a really good designer by playing as many games as you possibly can, and I got to where I'm at now where I feel like I have an idea of what I want a game to be thematically and I have sort of an arsenal of mechanics to draw upon to sort of plug in to make whatever I want to have happen in the game happen and I that that's where, what works for me but that's not the point of today's video. Today we're going to be discussing the third thing that a lot of designers don't really have in their, uh, they don't put on that same level, and maybe they shouldn't, but it's right there, and I know that a lot of people don't have it in focus, and that is the size and scope of your game. How many components are going there, are there going to be? Because that's very, very important, especially if you're like myself and you're doing self-publishing through the Game Crafter. Um, I really have to be um, frugal with the amount of um, content that I put into my games as far as um, components. Now, I try to put in as much possible content as I can mechanically and thematically to sort of offset and compensate for the fact that there are less cards. I can't charge uh, for a say $30 game, if you got a $30 game off the shelf at Target, it's going you could potentially have you know 200 cards and a bunch of custom bits and things of that nature. I can't do that doing this print on demand. I can't I can't possibly match the amount of content as far as components, but I can do my best to offset that with um, solid mechanics and a, and, a, and a good theme. So my point is you should or i for me personally i think it's very important to consider how many components are in your game now there's a lot of benefits to this obviously for myself it helps me as a for as a designer publisher who self publishes to keep my costs down and make the prices of my game um my games look attractive to customers but if you're a designer looking to pitch a game to a publisher, anyone who has done that successfully in the past will tell you that the smaller your game is, the more attractive it is to most publishers. So understanding how many cards there are on a sheet at a, you know, a Chinese manufacturer, having those understandings can really help you hone in and keep the size of your game um, down, making your game more attractive. To a publisher now if you're self-publishing and if you're using the game crafter for instance which is sort of become in my opinion the, the place to go obviously it's where all my games are um you have to be you have to be careful on your card counts and your component counts and all of your counts to keep your price reasonable um so something that I always do with all of my designs is once I have a gone through my I've done my previous videos I've shown you my stacks of notebooks that where I come up with my ideas the majority of them are not very good but I do write in notebooks you know layouts for cards and and I get kind of the general idea of my mechanics then I'll make up some index cards or I'll use um, these blank cards you can get on Amazon. And I'll start sort of making my crude prototypes. And once I have a general idea for how the game's gonna work and I'm pretty sure that I'm happy with it, then the next thing that I do is I try to see how small can I make it? How many cards do I really need? Um, in the case of all my tin series games, like Gate and Dust Runner, I have them all right here, it's a very small tin. Now the Game Crafter makes their mint tin cards that fit exactly in here, so they're a little bit larger. They're almost like a bridge size card with a little bit more rounded corners. And those are the larger cards that you can fit in there. And I know that I can fit 18 of those cards in that tin and also put in 32 of the mini cards and some components, some dice and some little um, bits that for counting or whatever, what have you. 
Um, so I know that going into a game now, when I'm making a game for my tin series, I know in my head, okay, I wanna make a, a, a deck builder. I only have this many cards, can I do it? To me, that gets my creative juices flowing. I love that constraint. Um, it's just like anyone who's ever designed a game for a contest. Typically, there's some sort of restraint. Sometimes it's a theme, and sometimes it's a component. Like if you've ever designed anything for, or, or, or attempted to design anything for like a button shy game, you have 18 cards. How can you make a game in 18 cards? That's a fun puzzle. Um, and just like it is for me to design these, these tin series games is trying to make as much as I can out of, out of the least amount of components. And I think as designers that we should be keeping that in focus m more than we probably are. I've been to quite a few protospiels, not in, in, a, in, a little, in, a few, in a few years, ever since COVID, I haven't been back. I will be, hopefully this year. But um, I've, I've seen games and I've seen designers, you know, they have a, a rather large game and they're in, in one of its, it's in us to maybe potentially solve an issue by adding more. Um, okay, I can solve this problem with my game by if I add this deck of resolution cards or some other some other mechanic, or maybe I'll add this and that can fix this. And you're, and you're balancing by adding. And I think that we should be more thinking about subtraction and reducing our games down to the smallest that they can be where they're still ex, ex, um, exciting and bring players back to them and still pull off a theme. And I don't think you need uh, a giant monster game. I, I feel like there's two camps on this. There's, there's these games on Kickstarter that are gigantic, you know, pledges for four or $500 more. I haven't even been on Kickstarter in a while, so I, I, I've seen people post pictures of these towers of boxes that they're receiving. I think it kind of goes back to Kingdom Death Monster. Might have been the first one that really seemed like extremely large. And, and I have no qualms if someone's into all the painting the minis and into all that, that's fine. But they're, you're talking thousands in, of cards and tons and tons of custom stuff. And I feel like you kind of lose sight of what makes designing, you know, special or fun. I think, like I said, trying to keep it as, as small as you can is, is for me personally, the, 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 the thing that keeps me going as a designer. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple different boxes um, and, and ways that it, those constraints helped me as a designer. Um, one is Zogar's Revenge. Um, this game is a game I designed for a contest and I believe it was a dungeon diving contest or some sort of something of that nature and it was on the Game Crafter. But I believe it had to be in this size box if I'm not mistaken. And I wanted to use their chits. So because of that, I had little tiles. If you, there's videos you can look on YouTube, you can look up Zogar's Revenge, you see what it looks like. But basically you're moving around and you're flipping tiles and you're trying to retrieve the crown that was stolen from the king. And because I used all these chits, the chit boards filled up the entire box. I had no room for dice. And because I had no room for dice, I, it, it created a challenge for me. And that challenge was, how do we create a combat system without dice? I grew up, I was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s, played lots of Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games. For me, when it comes to combat, dice are, are you typically used. Now, I know you can use cards. I have games that use cards as well. But I thought for a dungeon crawler, it should have dice. But I couldn't do that. So I had to come up with a unique combat system that used chits and flipping chits and having to sort of puzzle out um, what kind of damage output you can do. And that was exciting for me. And looking back at this game that I made five or six years ago, that's the thing that I remember. And I remember enjoying the most as a creative person was that challenge that it presented by having to uh, think outside the box. And I think if you're a, a designer that um, is looking, uh, if you're a creative person in general, th those types of things are, they should be fueling, those should be the fuel for you. Um, so that's probably the best example I have. But like I mentioned, like button shy games, and actually I just got this game, Armor Up, and it's by uh, Alicia from The Game Crafter. Um, awesome artwork in here. I, I have not played it yet. I have my kids this weekend. I do plan on playing it with them, with them then. Um, but 
what's the restraint for this? The restraint here is you have 18 cards, just like a button shy game. And all your rules and everything has to fit in this little, it's a little uh, like a hook box that opens up and you can put all your rules on. It's a really cool little um, um, system they have at the Game Crafter for these. But right away, how do you make a fun game um, with 18 cards? And if you own any button shy games, and there's a lot of games even at the Game Crafter and other games out there, there are 18 cards because it's 18 is very favorable for um because it's 18 cards per sheet at the game crafter so you can keep your cost down so it's a very favorable size and that once again it's there's that constraint how do i make a game with 18 cards that's fun that keeps people coming back well you design sprawlopolis or circle the wagons or all of the many fantastic games that are that are at the uh, that button shy has so to me, I keep going back to that. So when I see these giant games that are, you know, to me, they're excessive. Like you, and maybe I'm on a soapbox right now and I really don't want to cast any shade or I don't feel like um, these big games are bad games. I just feel like the chat, there should be a, a more of a challenge, not how big can we make it. I guess that is a challenge, how big we can make it. We're all, we all love seeing the, the, who can make the giant biggest pizza or whoever can make the biggest whatever. Like that's an attraction to us as humans. But I feel like when you build, put constraints around yourself, it really will help you as a designer. So what do I do as a designer? Like I said, I have a, uh, some sort of an idea uh, of what I want my game to be, like I'm working on UnderQuest right now, and I have an index card that once I had uh, UnderQuest sort of figured out in my mind as to what I needed, I wrote down the components that I was going to utilize so that I can actually start doing the illustration and graphic design work. And I'll go over basically really quickly what is going to be an underquest with a couple exceptions that I'm still on the fence about to give you an idea of where my head's at when I'm designing a game. First off, I wanted to use a different box than I used for Iron Helm. This is the Iron Helm box. It worked out fantastic for Iron Helm because you can fit um, rows of um, poker cards in here and the game's made up completely of poker cards and there's dividers for it. Worked out fantastic. Um, for that game but one thing one of the drawbacks um, for this box is that I can't fit a large booklet in it and I want a large booklet because I want to be able to fit all the rules for UnderQuest in one 20 page book so I'm going to be using the uh, small I'm sorry the medium stout box and this is a fantastic box super as good as any box on retail super thick cardboard it is uh, nine by six by two good size it allows me to make a large booklet so it'll be a nice big booklet and i will also likely have a separate booklet for random encounters then i have my dungeon deck which is tarot cards tarot size cards which is 2.75 times 4.75 so quite a bit larger than a poker card and i've posted plenty of pictures of those i only have four more left to illustrate very excited about the mechanics of that deck a future video will be coming soon as soon as i get those cards done i'm going to have just that deck printed and sent to me so i can do a video to show you how the mechanics of the dungeon deck actually work um, but there's 18 cards in that deck. There are 10 cards per sheet at the Game Crafter for tarot size cards, which leaves me with two cards. And I will be using those for some sort of reference cards like I did in Tin Helm with, as far as explaining how the, the camp works, or just quick reference things that will help the player. So you always have to be thinking, at least for myself, I'm always thinking about utilizing the entire sheet of cards, especially especially when self-publishing at the Game Crafter. You don't want to make a game with, uh, this, for example, 16 cards and, and not use those two extra cards because you get 18 cards if you're using poker size. Um, and the flip side, you don't want to make a game with 19 cards because now you're going to have to pay for another whole sheet just for that one card. So that's $3 for the cost of your game goes up or two and a half, whatever it is for a, a, um, a sheet of cards now. You don't need that. So you're always trying to keep, you should always be uh, thinking about the cost of your game, especially if you're self-publishing. But like I said early and earlier on in the video, if you're d going to be pitching your game to a publisher, size, um, having your game smaller is going to be um, more um, attractive to a publisher. Now, 
what else i have a bunch of poker cards in this game i'll have loot cards i have skill cards the race and class cards uh, trapping cards afflictions your torch bearers which are sort of your sidekicks in this game are all going to be in poker size and if you add up the card counts on all of them it works out to be a x number of sheets of cards so there will be no waste um, the enemy cards, which I've sh are completed, are already posted. You can look at them all on uh, social media. Those are all on jumbo cards, which are 3.5 by 5.5, so rather large cards. And I'm very excited about how those came out. And there's uh, once, including the bosses, which I haven't completed yet, there'll be 24 total. So those are six cards per sheet for a total of 24, which means I'll be using four sheets, even number again, that works out perfectly math wise. Um, what else we have? Oh, the mini cards. So I will be, um, there'll be two different types or decks of cards. They'll be utilizing mini cards and those are trinkets and ingredients. Now ingredients are what are utilized or the mechanic for creating potions in Underquest. And there is a video on how that works. Uh, one of my prior videos a couple of episodes ago i believe and uh trinkets which uh replace gold there are there's no just money in underquest no just gold to buy stuff you'll find trinkets there'll be all different sorts of strange little objects and they'll it'll be completely unique all 24 of them and you'll trade those they'll all have a value so it's basically gold but instead of just having gold coins i thought it'd be fun to have more thematics and have a bunch of unique cool things you can find and some of them may even have um, um, a, a powers and abilities that you can burn them to you can utilize them instead of actually trading them so it'll give you sort of that player choice thing which i'm a big fan of um so there's going to be 40 ingredients and uh 24 mini um, i'm sorry 24 trinkets for a total of 64 those are 32 per deck so that it works out perfect again i'll be using two sheets for those um <clears throat> uh, lastly the one thing I'm sort of on the fence about is how quests are going to work, whether it's going to be cards or whether it's going to be another separate book for how uh, for quests. We'll get more into that um, in future episodes when I get sort of more diving into underquests. I did want to just mention a little bit about underquests in this video, but there'll be obviously more videos going into the mechanics for that game and where I came um, up with them and how they work. But really the focus of this video was to reach out um, to other designers to start start thinking about how big your game is before you start developing it too far, right? Um, you want to keep the card co count down, components down, that'll make your box smaller. All of those things are good, especially if you're planning on self-publishing. Now, we've all seen those games in retail stores that have giant boxes. You open them up and there's like nothing in it. That's pretty upsetting and it upsets me as a consumer, mainly because I only have so much self, uh, shelf space, but also it just seems like a waste of, of material. So there is a um, environmental cost also to be thinking about. Not that I'm um, pushing that sort of p p politics, but I do think that if we can make a game smaller, um, it's only it's only better for the environment. You can't. There's no way there, that it's not. So if I can continue to make small games, I feel like that's that's better than if I made giant giant games. So that's another just sort of a, a another perk to designing small. So the main focus of this video is design small. Try to keep your games as small as you can. Um, it's a challenge, but it's a fun challenge, and it'll make you come up with things that you um, wouldn't have considered before. You'll be making games with multi-use cards that have multiple functions. It does One card does four things, and it, it, that challenge is going to make you a better designer. So thank you very much for sticking around and listening to me babble on and on and on about um, all of this stuff, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you.